Hi, everyone. Hey, good evening. I'm Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. And I am so, so happy to welcome all of you to live from NYPL. Those joining us here in person um, in the newly renovated Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library, and all of you joining us online. This is just our second week of in-person programming after two very, very long years, and it is just so wonderful to be together again. So tonight we are delighted to welcome the great, prolific journalist, historian, scholar, and so much more, Fintan O'Toole, back to the library to debut his most recent work, We Don't Know Ourselves, A Personal History of Modern Ireland. This beautifully written book is both a memoir and a national history of Ireland, taking us through the collective experience of a country opening itself up to the world and the very personal experience of finding one's place within it. You can purchase copies of the book if you haven't yet done so from the library shop, both here and online. And Finton will be signing copies afterwards, so please, please stick around for that. And of course, if you have a library card, which if you live in New York State, hopefully you do, uh, you can check out a copy of the book as well. Joining Finton in conversation is Belinda McKeon, a fellow Irish critic, novelist, and academic whose work likewise explores the changes and contradictions of contemporary Ireland. We are so thrilled to have both of them with us. So for some of you joining us in person, this might be your first time here in our beautiful space overlooking Fifth Avenue, atop the largest circulating branch in the entire New York Public Library system. So I want to just take a second to encourage you to explore this beautiful new Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library. It is a true architectural marvel that represents the very best of what public libraries have to offer with eight floors of books and programming and resources for all ages. And on that note, I'm very excited to announce that on May 3rd, the visionary architects who led the transformation of this building, uh, Francine Hubin and Elizabeth Lieber, will be joining us here at Live for a conversation. Um, and so we hope you'll come back for that. So here in our central branch, as well as in our flagship research library directly across the street and online, live from NYPL is back and uh, it's better than ever. In the coming weeks and months, we will bring you conversations with our best writers, thinkers, artists, and creators. Tomorrow night on the Ides of March, the great classicist Mary Beer joins us to launch her newest book, The Twelve Caesars, in conversation with Tim Gunn. Coming up, we have Elizabeth Alexander, Yasha Monk, Ann Carson, Shishin Lu, Margot Jefferson, Doreen Sanfili, Andre Asiman, and many, many more to be announced. Later in the spring, on select Friday evenings, we're going to launch a new series featuring readings, drinks, and mingling right here on our rooftop terrace, which is the only free public rooftop in Manhattan, we believe. <laughs> And we have so much more. So you'll find all of this information uh, at nypl.org slash live and on the QR codes on the little printed cards that you got at the check-in table. And we're so proud at the library to be able to offer all of this programming to you for free and deeply grateful to the donors who make that happen, including Manaz Ispahani Bartos, Adam Bartos, and Celeste Bartos, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and of course, all of you, our wonderful supporters and friends near and far. So thank you and welcome back. Uh, I'm gonna bring our guests up to the stage in just a second. I just wanna let you know, Fintan and Belinda will be taking questions at the end of the programs. If you're here in the room, you'll notice that there's some note cards on your chairs. Someone from our team will come around and collect them later on. And if you're watching online, please share your question in the chat or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org uh, and they'll get to as many questions as they can. Okay, now please welcome Fintan O'Toole and Belinda McKeon. Good evening. Thank you all for being here um, and huge thanks to the New York Public Library for hosting us. Um, congratulations on this beautiful space. Um, I would like to start by saying that Fintan O'Toole is indispensable. Um, he's one of those people, um, presences in culture 
for whom so many of us are not just deeply grateful, um, but also a little relieved that he exists. Because I've can't, l- sort of lost count of the number of times I've opened the paper or opened the web page, to be honest, these days. I thought, oh, thank God, Finton has written about it. I can, I can get some sense of, I can, I can make a little more sense of whatever this situation may be. Um, he doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll give you a little bit of an introduction in any case. He's written more books than I could count when I tried to, uh, sub- to uh, get the list together this afternoon. Um, he's a journalist, critic, um, intellectual, public intellectual, and an academic. He teaches um, at Princeton University, where I'm sure his students um, are having an, am- an amazing experience this semester uh, doing a course called Sally Rooney and Her Contemporaries. Um, and you're also teaching on the um, dead, dead bodies, <laughs> dead bodies <laughs> in okay. plays and films. Yeah. Not not real ones, just 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 uh, pretend ones. <laughs> One of the reasons I mention, or that I begin by saying that you know. Um, Fintan O'Toole is indispensable is because one of the great uh, pleasures of this book is how it shows us, and I know I know you won't uh, relish hearing this, but it shows us how Fintan O'Toole came into being, the twists and turns of fate and of Irish uh, history that made it possible for him to become the thinker and the critic uh, that he is. So one of those, in fact, was the public library, the the the. Uh, um, the importance that the public library plays in Irish life. Um, another was uh, the institution of free secondary education in 1966. But there were many others, and it is a pleasure, you know, as a as a colleague and as somebody who as an admirer of Fintons to read the um, not the subtext so much because as as Ray said, this is both a memoir and a cultural history. But to look at how each year that's tracked in this book. Um, was both important personally, professionally, and culturally uh, for you. Um, Just one last thing I want to say by way of introduction. I laughed when we were back in the green room and Fintan mentioned that um, he received a lot of photographs on Christmas morning from from people who'd been given three copies of the book for Christmas, you know, one from each of their adult children sort of thing. Um, but actually, I think that's kind of apt because it is a book that is about the uh, parallel realities or the ways in which Ireland exists in so many ways, has existed in um, in plain sight and in hiding all at once. You know, that there, there are kind of three different versions, at least, of Ireland, and three different versions of Fintan O'Toole as well. So that seems pretty fitting to me. Um, Fintan, congratulations on the book. It's really remarkable. Um, I know that a lot of people are are watching tonight out of a love of Ireland and out of you know a connection to Ireland, but it, it's also a very it's 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 unrelenting in its exposure of some of the darknesses of Irish history, uh, of which there are many, and it's really um, uncompromising in in its exploration of that here and there, hiding in plain sight, and 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 yet speaking and not speaking that kind of dichotomy that's everywhere yeah. in Irish life. Did it did it emerge as a project out of a particular observation of that tendency in Irish life, or did you know that you always wanted to track it in this way? Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for for being here. Um, I know I wouldn't come out um, to hear me, so I'm extremely grateful, uh, and I'm extremely grateful to the library, one of the most civilized institutions in the world, and it's it's such an honor to to, to be here, and particularly to be here with with Belinda, whose writing I've admired so much for so many years. Um, so yeah, I, I I sort of had the idea somehow that because I've been writing about Ireland for so long, you know, um, in, in the Irish Times, particularly since 1988. Um, so I, you know, I I I, I have a lot of um, both pu- of public memory, as it were, in terms of my own <laughs> archive. But there's also the private memory. You know, there's the other s- set of memories about just ordinary life and family and uh, how how you yourself developed. Um, and it it just struck me, you know, I'm a privileged person. I I have a newspaper column. I can you know sound off. I can say what I like. And I, I just somehow I was just thinking about a friend of mine um, who I write about a little bit in the book. You know, who who was the most Irish person I ever met. You know, he he, he spoke Irish. He was from Dublin. He was a working class guy from Dublin, but he he loved the Irish language so much that he would 
he was a great linguist, you know, he spoke lots of languages, but he'd made Irish his first language. You'd be talking to him and he'd he'd say, what's the English for that? You know, <laughs> he'd have it in his head, you know, but, and he, he was, he ended up working as a translator in the Irish parliament, you know, translating stuff into, into Irish. And I just remembered, this was, you know, in the 1980s, that he just said, I'm leaving, I'm, 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 I'm going. And I, I couldn't get over, like he had a very good job and he loved Ireland deeply, you know, he had an absolutely passionate sense of it. And and he was just going. Uh, and I, I couldn't understand it, you know. And I remember he had a going away party and I just said to him, are you leaving because you're gay? And he said, of course I'm leaving because I'm gay. I just can't stand it. I just can't bear the idea that I'm a second class citizen in the country that I love so much. And I, I don't know, for some reason, that's I started thinking about that, you know, these these twin realities, you know, of 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 what's authentic you know what's what is the real ireland you know what why did so many people feel both passionately in love with the place and and very very attached to it as as i do and also feel that they had to hide aspects of themselves in order to be irish or that ireland pushed them away um and and this sort of strange structure mental structure that the place had built really that it had an official version of what it was to be Irish, which was increasingly at odds with the way the vast majority of Irish people were thinking and living. Um, and so that doubleness that you mentioned, I mm -hmm. think, was it just sort of it struck me as maybe the organizing thing, if you wanted to try to tell the story of Ireland over the course of my particular lifetime, which is since 1958, which was the year in which Ireland really realized the game was up for traditional Ireland and had to open up to particularly American multinational capital to try to modernize itself. So over all of that period, I think there was this kind of strange doubleness, you know, of trying to live as if nothing was happening, as if the place wasn't changing radically. And at the same time, you know, to become what Ireland is now, which is one of the most globalized societies in the world. Right, and yet you trace that globalization throughout the chapters, and one of the one of the most um, uh, powerful moments is when you talk about how heroin started to come into the communities in in Crumlin, where you grew up, and and elsewhere in Dublin, um, and and how that was a particular type of globalization in itself. You know, that had come that white powder in the sp in the in the spoon. You said came down through the the uh, Iranian Revolution. It came from the yeah. Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and now these kids. Um, were who were having their lives destroyed were the victims of the, of a globalization rather than yeah. um, and of course their uh, immediate predecessors many of them had emigrated yes. um, had, yeah. the numbers are astonishing as you show um, what was it like to reflect on your own life through this lens you know I I um well it's far too boring to write a memoir really <laughs> you know I didn't I mean apart from my affair with Jackie Kennedy and those things, which I won't mention, um, you know, but, but like, like, really, I, I don't have any of those stories. Like, I, 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 I've spent most of my life writing um, and, and uh, but I, I realized that one of the things about a small country is that sort of everybody's life intersects with public, the public world, you know, mm -hmm. so in Ireland, there's not, but both for good and ill, right? So it was a place where it's hard to be private. You know, because people were curious about you, and who, who you know, uh, and and the church was watching you all the time. But also, the other, the good side of that was that you know, nothing felt very distant from anything else. And it it, it just struck me that um, almost anybody in Ireland could tell s similar sorts of versions of the same stories. And it was just that, you know, um, I I just for example, right? I tell a story in the book about my my father was a bus conductor, um, which is a job that's now kind of completely disappeared you know but and and he was out he i mean much more than he loved he was a, he loves his family he loves his children and his wife but much more than that he loved muhammad ali you know he just loved muhammad. and he was he was out on the bus one early one morning you know the foothills of dublin this is in like 1972 where there were almost no people of color in ireland you know it was about the most monolithically white place on earth and and you know he's he's on the bus, and he's just looking out. It's early morning, most people are half asleep on the bus, you know. And, and there are these beautiful black men 
running up the hill. <laughs> and one of them is Muhammad Ali, you know. And Ali was in town. He, he, you know, he, he, was, he was having a fight in Dublin and he was staying somewhere and he was out for a run. Now, I mean, the fact that anybody was running in Ireland, like, was, that was shocking <laughs> itself, you know. And then that these, these godlike men, you know. And he stopped the bus and, you know, and he asked Ali, did he want a lift, you know. And, and Ali, Ali got on the bus and, and, you know, they had banter about it. And Ali said, I, I don't have any money to pay the fare. He said, oh, well, for you, we'll make an exception. You know, it was all this kind of... And my, I just remember my father coming home that day, you know, and glowing, you know, just glowing with... And he used a word that no man in Ireland had ever used in the entire history of Ireland but another man, which was beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was so beautiful, you know. And, and somehow, you know, the, the, this gets you thinking about... Because, of course, what happened in Ireland then was... was Irish people couldn't deal with anything that was not Irish. So they started looking for Muhammad Ali and saying, because he's really an O'Grady from County Clare, you know, like that, which was true. Like his, his great grandfather was Abe Grady from County Clare. You know, but, but Ali didn't want to be, you know, that. I mean, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali for a very good reason, right? That, as, as far as he mm -hmm. saw, this was the whole history of slavery and shame. And it was just a really strange, you know, we just had this kind of way of doing these sorts of things where, you know, we, we, we dealt with the outside world by sort of trying to reduce it as much as possible to Irishness. You know? <laughs> and if we could find some kind of connection, I say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's really Irish, isn't it? You know, th then that made it OK. Um, and it was a, both a kind of generous thing in one way, which was everybody can be Irish and you can include everything in it, but also a sort of quite a a limiting thing, you know, which was that that recognizing other experiences or recognizing complexity and diversity, and and that maybe some people actually weren't Irish and didn't want to be Irish, you know, that that was that was okay too. So, but but I I, I just thought the texture of that you could tell stories like that in Ireland because it's so intimate and so close. Um, so there was a way of writing that isn't really quite memoir, but that uses memory, mm -hmm. uses family, uses those kind of vignettes as a way to open up larger questions. So that's the way I kind of try to tell the story. And so you begin with the year of your birth and what was happening, in fact, on the weekend of your birth. You know, one of the one of one of the things ironically was that the Dublin Theatre Festival was cancelled for a for a future theatre critic, I yeah. thought it was fitting. <laughs> um, well you mentioned your father getting off the bus to talk to Muhammad Ali and you know, you also said there that your your memoir would be too boring. But it's fascinating actually how many times in the book your life did in intersect with um, very significant figures. You know, you go to the Gale Fox as a kid to learn Irish and the fellow playing the composer in the church is Sean O'Reida. Um, you go later to uh, buy milk in the next shop and you're mistaken for one of the most notorious <laughs> murderers in Irish life, Malcolm MacArthur. Leopold Bloom, the story of Leopold Bloom being buried in, in, in a back garden in Dublin, which is a, a fiction that took on its own shape. Yeah. Uh, you may have referred to the back to, garden of the house in which house, you grew absolutely. up. Yeah. Um, and then that word fiction is one that you use um, in a really interesting way through the book. I mean, you're writing about Irish fictions, right? The <clears> ways in which... Um, through Irish, the history of the tw of the twentieth century, fiction became an an, an essential tool you know, for, for survival. Um, the Jack Kennedy, the JFK visit. You know, you mentioned mentioned your affair with uh, Jack Ken Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> um, his visit to Ireland is 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 a centerpiece of the book in a way. It's um, one of the chapters in which we see that uh, combination of admiration and, and othering that becomes so complicated because you pick apart his speeches, which seem so flattering and lovely, but actually when you look at them, they're quite, well, not, not, you don't use the word patronizing, but they're definitely a little less um, warm. And there's always that tension between feeling at home and, and, and feeling out of place. Exactly, you know, so, so, well, you know, everybody in New York, of course, knows this. I mean, but th this is a culture that's so deeply shaped by mass emigration, you know, so, so, and has been for a very long time. Uh, and mass emigration, in one way, is, you know, was very successful. The, the Irish were very successful migrants. Uh, but of course, it's also traumatic. You know, mm. it's also deeply traumatic. And particularly in the Irish case, of course, so much of the, the impetus for this huge exodus of people, of course, was the Great Famine in the 1840s. You know, so it's, it's attached with, to shame, 
to to loss and uh, and to a kind of heroic denial you know i, I think so the the decade i was born in even in the 1950s there were two countries in Europe over the course of the 1950s, which was, of course, the great baby boom, you know, the recovery from the war, you know, this great energy of rebuilding, repopulating Europe. Two countries in Europe lost population in the 1950s. One was East Germany and the other was Ireland. Mm. You know, and East Germany could at least build a wall to keep people in eventually, you know, and Ireland couldn't do that. You know, so, so this, 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 long, long history of mass emigration. If you just think about what that did to people, to families, for example, you know, where, where you were raising a kid knowing that they were going to leave. And it's not like now, it's not, it's not like, you know, it's not leaving and coming back for Christmas, you know, on the, on the 747. You know, famously in Ireland, really up to quite late in the 20th century, there was what was called the American Wake. You know, and the American wake was when somebody was going to America, you basically held their funeral before they left because you would never see them again. It was like they they were dead. And this might be somebody of 17, 18, 19, 20, you know. And, and a culture that knows it's going to do that has to develop a certain kind of storytelling ability, isn't it? I think to, mm -hmm. to tell stories about itself that kind of ignore uh, this biggest facts, which is this sort of mass exodus of people, tell stories that somehow kind of pretends that we're still all together somehow. Uh, you know, the, the, the fictional side of it actually becomes very important, as you say. And maybe some of the energy, some, maybe one of the reasons why Ireland produces so many great writers is that there are all these sort of strange vacuums that have to be filled, all this stuff that doesn't quite make sense or doesn't cohere. And so you need the novelists, particularly, and the playwrights and the poets to sort of somehow fill in all of those spaces. Um, but uh, it, it, it can be very productive imaginatively, but also very disabling politically and socially, because mm -hmm. it means you have this incredible capacity not to, pr to pretend that stuff isn't happening, that is happening, and, and not to know about it. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about in terms of the, you know, the, the book was, you remember Donald Rumsfeld had his famous kind of thing about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. And he missed, he missed the Irish one, which was the, the unknown known. You know, the thing that everybody knows and everybody pretends not to know. Mm -hmm. you know? And that worked in politics, it worked in religion, it worked with child abuse, for example, mm -hmm. as, as a huge issue with the church, uh, with these institutions that were everywhere that nobody managed to see somehow. Um, and I think it was rooted in that sort of psych psychology of emigration, whereby you get very good at sort of pretending stuff isn't happening. You've got. The, I'm just going to read one paragraph that I made a note of because I thought it, it was so striking in summing that up. And it also has a phrase I want to ask you a little about. This was a way of functioning through silence, evasion, creative ambiguity that could be normal only in a society in which power seems permanent while ordinary life is changing. If it appears that the structures of authority are so deeply rooted that they will not alter even as the society is transformed, the vast majority of people will not confront that authority directly. They will navigate their way around it, tacking and jibing to avoid the reefs of public antagonism and shame. If anybody who's grown up in Ireland will know that yeah. that jest or that that whole dance of tacking and jibing and you know dancing around the thing not saying not saying the thing directly yeah. and also hoping that somebody else will do the confronting for you which yeah. is for example the chapter on gay burn and the late late show you talk about how some of his importance was that he said the things that irish people didn't want to say themselves yes. um yes. but that whole idea of creative was it you said creative ambiguity you know it, it is that it's that cleverness but also um outright lying yeah. right so it, it, yeah. it's in a figure like charlie high you see the aggression and you see the you know the, the, the dark much darker side of that and obviously uh, mcquade the archbishop um it has its yeah. incredibly dark um layers yeah you know so so this stuff has a kind of almost a funny side to it um like for example in the 1960s and 1970s ireland had irish women had the highest recorded uh, incidents of menstrual cycle problems in the world. Why? Because contraceptives were banned, 
But if you went to your doctor and the doctor said, oh, you, you need the pill to regulate your menstrual cycle, that's not a sin. So suddenly, like, Irish women developed enormous problems with their menstrual cycles, you know. <laughs> so, that, you know, this, these ways of, you know, so that, 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 like, you could get the pill if you knew what it was you had to say to your doctor, and your doctor got the signals and understood how that worked. So you say something uh, like, I'm tired. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm tired. Yeah. Um, I have cramps. You know, yeah. And, and as you uh, pointed uh, out, like it's... doctors would say, well, actually, I, I found a list of the things that you could yeah. you could prescribe the pill for, like putting on weight, <laughs> you know? or like you know, it was sort of mm -hmm. everything, really, mm -hmm. almost anything. But you needed to know, as a woman, you know, who who you could trust, mm -hmm. uh, and then where you could go, because you also needed a pharmacist to fill the prescription who wouldn't object and would be in on the game, and uh, that was all over the place in Ireland. And some of it was kind of funny. And as I said, some of it was very imaginative and creative, right? It makes people kind of on their toes thinking about how do I get around all these things. But some of it is not funny at all, you know. So some of it was, uh, so political corruption, for example. Uh, it, you know, for most of my life, what, in a way, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, the most dominant kind of political figure was a guy called Charles Hoy, who was prime minister a couple of times and was minister of finance. And, and he was a very brilliant, very, very able politician. He'd been in full-time politics for all of my life. I mean, like the year before I was born, he became a member of parliament. And, you know, but by the 1980s, he had, he lived in the finest Georgian mansion in Dublin. He had a stud farm. He had racehorses. He had um, helicopters. He had a private island, you know, beautiful island, like one of the Blasket Islands. Um, you know, he had a yacht. And... This was all on his public salary, you know, like, like even early in the 1960s, his, you know, like he, when he, no, well, in the 70s, his salary was, say, $35,000 a year. And he was, his staff costs for his mansion was $300,000 a year, right? <laughs> just, just on his staff, right? Just, you know, like, and he wore nothing, but he got all his shirts handmade in Paris. And, you know, he only drank the finest wines. And in a way, like everybody knew this because it wasn't secret, you know? But everybody pretended that he was doing all of this on his public salary, because otherwise you would have to think there's something going on here. You know, mm -hmm. where is he getting the money? Mm -hmm. Who's paying for all of this sort of stuff? What relationship does he have with certain business people? And and even darker then was 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 the church. You know, so uh, you mentioned I I you know in my um, Zelig um, capacity I I served mass for. The dominant figure in Ireland when I was born was a guy called John Charles McQuaid, who was the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. So, uh, as you mentioned, like uh, on the weekend I was born, the Dublin Theatre Festival was cancelled, completely just cancelled, because he had indicated his displeasure, not even publicly, that uh, adaptation of uh, James Joyce, uh, a part of, of James Joyce's Ulysses, was going to be put on, and a play by Sean O'Casey, um, and these were people he didn't like. And he just indicated his displeasure and the entire festival was cancelled, you know, this sort of thing. He, I, I tell the story in the book, which is, again, the sort of slightly funny side of it, but uh, the, like the national radio station played, um, they had a, requ a hospitals requests program when somebody was in hospital, you, you, you know, you, and they would play a record for them. And somebody asked for a Cole Porter's, I'm always true to you, darling, in my fashion, always true to you, darling, in my way. And, you know, the, like the next day, like there's a phone call from the Archbishop's Palace. And the, the radio station never played that again because the Archbishop said, in my fashion, true to you, in my fashion, this is encouraging adultery. You can't have this on the radio. You know, so the next time the request came in, they played the instrumental version you know, with, without Cole Porter's lyrics. And that, that sort of stuff you know, was just kind of standard. But I equally, like the, t the time that I served mass for him, and he was this regal figure. I mean, uh, people don't quite find this hard to believe, but I swear it's true. I, I, I was serving mass. I was walking up the road, and there was this huge car. Like We never saw cars like that, you know, because um, it, it, it was kind of a working class suburb. And there was a guy kneeling on the, uh, on the pavement, you know, uh, uh, on, on the sidewalk. And there were two feet sticking out of the car like that. And I didn't know. I was eight. You know, I just, what is going on here? And the, the guy who was kneeling was in a sort of uniform. And I, as I was passing, I realized that the, the archbishop was sitting in his car 
with his feet sticking out and his chauffeur was polishing his shoes. Was, I mean, kneeling on the sidewalk, polishing his shoes. You know, and it really was like the emperor, you know, the emperor had arrived. But, but what I didn't know was that at that time, like he, he had just, so he, you know, he was, he was, he was charismatic and wonderful. I mean, it, you know, I said it was really like being the kid and the king has arrived in your little village. And, but only subsequently did I realize that, you know, there, there was a children's hospital just very close to us. And, you know, he, he had, he'd been told, I mean, he knew that the Catholic chaplain in the children's hospital was abusing the children. He knew, you know, like the police went to him and told him, they gave him photographs, they gave him everything. And instead of the police prosecuting, of course, the police went to the archbishop and said, could you deal with this? <laughs> he said, leave it to me, we don't want any scandal. And then did nothing. I mean, just left the guy in place. And then eventually that guy left and, and he appointed another guy who abused, you know, like knowingly, you know. So, so this darkness, this, this sense of two worlds, you know, two mm. ways of, of going on, you know, uh, ha had that very dark side as well. And, and, and of course, it was women and children in particular, I think, who were the victims yeah. of it. I mean, yeah. even while you were there talking about um, the uh, menstrual, uh, the immense number of Irish women who had, who had menstrual problems, you know, obviously that's funny in its way, but the doctors and the pharmacists that they would have been dealing with were mo almost entirely men. So you had this whole uh, generation of Irish women who had to ask permission to have, who must have their menstrual problems yeah. from from men. And, and I don't need to, to even point out how dark the the darkness was when it came to McQuaid and the cover the cover ups. Um, mm -hmm. One of those priests you mentioned um, was in Crumlin where you grew yeah. up uh, mm -hmm. and his, his, um, you know, it was a reign of terror really for young boys yeah. over the course of 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, I have my own story about this, which is that my aunt was the housekeeper in that parish uh, for many years. Um, I don't think she served for that priest. I think mm. she was mostly with the priest afterwards. But I, I spent a lot of time as a child in that very presbytery. Wow. And I do remember her telling me that there used to be a swimming pool um, and that it was now, yeah. but it was walled off. And that priest, the prede predecessor to my aunt, the priest that my aunt worked for, um, had those swimming pools installed so that it would, he could invite young boys in and abuse them. Yeah. Um, so, it's, you know, when I was reading your book, I, I, this Fine. detail Fine. came floating into view. I said, I know that house. Good God. I spent yeah. time in that house as yeah. a child. Yeah. I remember how foreboding parts of it were. Wow. My aunt had her own apartment, but there were, there's a dining room for the priests and it just, yeah. yeah. The things that happened in the house. But so, to, you know, even when you're telling those stories, Fenton, you know, it's, 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 it strikes me how you move between the humor and the darkness. You know, we can tell these stories about the shoes or the, the, the number of women with menstrual problems, and they are funny. Um, but it doesn't take long to, to, to slide into the immense darkness in which they, you know, they imprisoned people, those, those situations for so long. It's a particularly, not particularly, but it's an Irish trait and it's a trait of other cultures as well, obviously, to make, you know, to joke about about situations yeah. like this in order maybe to make them more bearable. But but is that what it is? I mean, if we hadn't, if we didn't have this habit of joking or of, of seeing the humour in very fucked up situations, would we, do you think, as a people have been able to overcome them more more quickly? You know, if, if, we, if it wasn't that for that doubleness of saying, oh, you know, Making a joke about it, you know. I I was, if you read about the wonderfully brave people at the moment in yeah. in in Moscow or in Saint Petersburg or wherever who are out protesting, you know, uh, and you know, I I was just it's it, there's always jokes, you know. There's the, there's the horror of it, and then there's you know. Well, we, we, I saw there was a did you see there was a woman arrested for holding up a blank. She just held she held up a blank sheet of paper, uh, you know, or just the cardboard, and she was arrested. And you see her being hauled up, and it's 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 grotesque and horrific, and you know that she's probably going to be beaten, and but but like for a blank piece of paper, you know, and 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 then you get you know all the Russian jokes, they, you know, they're full of jokes about authority and about you know, and and I suppose Jewish people have so many jokes about the horrors, and you, you know, so so cultures develop this sense of humor as a way of 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 getting through it, I suppose, yeah. and just just coping with it, um, and. The, the the Irish thing was was um, definitely you know the the humor the invention the storytelling 
you know, was all part of this wonderfully evasive culture, mm -hmm. you know, this way of, of getting around things. Um, and some of it is psychotic, you know, like that you, you can't get around the fact that, you know, some of it's, as you say, very um, entertaining, you know, but there's something like, I don't know, if, have people heard of the Magdalene Laundries? Have you heard of this? You know, so, so these were institutions where, I mean, ordinary people sent their laundry, you know, to be done in these institutions. And the laundry was done by slaves. I mean, I, I'm not using that term with any kind of exaggeration. Young women who were thought to be in moral danger or to be causing moral danger to anybody else, you know, uh, who, who, who knows what that means. Often they were young girls who had been themselves abused or raped, you know, and then they're in a moral danger, taken from their homes and incarcerated in these lawn, you know, in these institutions where they had to work all day cleaning the dirty laundry of the society. I mean, th that's almost a joke. I mean, right. it's, the, it's the almost at the point of saying, nose, you know, right? come on, yeah. you, you couldn't, like that's, you couldn't make that up. It's, it's far too crude as a, as, a, as a way of dealing with things. And these laundries were not far away. I mean, they weren't in, you know, way over in the countryside where nobody could see them. I mean, if anybody knows Dublin, like the center of Dublin is O'Connell Street. And like the, 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 the there's a Magdalene Laundry six, seven minutes walk from the center of O'Connell Street, a huge institution, which, which closed in the 1990s. Like it, it didn't close in the 1890s, it closed in the 1990s, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's still a lot of women, you know, alive and, 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 and angry, you know, who were incarcerated in those institutions, uh, who were, who were for, forced labor. I mean, they were never paid. They had no legal rights. They, you know, they were, they were just taken away and put in there and everybody knew everybody had to know because this, this, this was not secret you know and how do you do that how do you manage to carry on with an with ordinary life you know and of course the way that it was done was simply to, to to say if anybody ever asked well those are fallen women they're women who you know they did something shameful oh, we, oh well, well then we don't want to know about that that's that's you know what, what once sexuality was brought into it and particularly female sexuality you know the control mm -hmm. of female sexuality it was kind of regarded as legitimate in a way you, you you had to keep keep a lid on that because otherwise it would all go go crazy but it's also a form of dissociation on a massive scale right yeah. you know that yeah. really it's not just seeing it and categorizing it but there was a huge amount of not seeing things that were not vividly or fully seeing things that were right under our noses you know i mentioned the heroin epidemic yeah Garrett Fitzgerald, a politician um, at Taoiseach, um, you talk about how his his government just, because it was the working class, I guess, it was a working class problem, they just didn't see it. It, it just didn't register. And that is, that is an unforgivable form of blindness. But I think there's also a sense in which it is the dissociation that comes out of trauma in itself, you know, or maybe, I mean, I'm not making excuses, believe me, but it seems more than just looking away. It seems like a, a, an astonishing inability to see when the thing is right there. And that's because the mind, you know, the, the cultural mind, the mind of the, of the, of the state has, um, has, has compartmentalized to such yeah. an extent. Yeah. 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 Compartmentalization, I think, is, is, is really what happens with trauma, isn't it? I mean, what traumatized people do is they, they develop one mind, which is for getting on with life and, and trying to be normal. And they have another mind in which all the other stuff is going on, you know. And, and I think Ireland, uh, this is not unique at all. I mean, we all do this, right, to some extent. And, and, and God knows there's, there's a lot in American history and American life, you know, which people compartmentalize out as well. But, but I think Ireland was kind of shaped around it to a, to a yeah. very, very large extent. And I think, I think emigration was at the key, uh, key to this. But also the compensation for being poor was to be the most Catholic country, you know. You couldn't just be like Catholic, you had to be like more Catholic than everybody else, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it became a sort of identity that other places did these things and we and we didn't, and by these things I mean like sex, you know, and, and you know, uh, all that sort of idea of what was immoral was sort of, we don't, we don't do that stuff. And there was this idea that somehow if the law, like so, so like, for example, the, the law under which Oscar Wilde was prosecuted and imprisoned in the 1890s in England 
was still in force in Ireland a hundred years later. Still in force, you know. It was still uh, potentially, although it, it didn't actually happen, but it, it potentially the statute book said there was life imprisonment could be could be the punishment for for sex, consenting sex between adult men, you know. Now, did anybody really believe that there were no gay men in Ireland or that that didn't happen, you know? No, but they just, they wanted it to be clear that it didn't happen in public, you know, that there were, I don't mean it didn't happen in public, <laughs> but that, you know, that it was not acknowledged as, as, as part of Irish normality, you know, or that, that, that young women got pregnant, you know. Uh, if they did, they had to be institutionalized. They had to be kept away. Babies taken off them. You know, the mother and baby homes was another set of institutions where women were just kind of shunted away to have their babies. And I, I found there was a, a piece in the Irish Times actually in the 1960s, which which described it as our, the the Irish Secret Service. And I thought it was a very interesting. What was the Irish uh, Secret Service? The, the mother and baby the homes. Mother and baby you know? homes. Yeah. And there was there was a whole system we of also worked quite codes. closely with the American authorities as yeah. well for, for, <laughs> yeah. the, for adoption. You know, to to farm those kids out. I mean, kids were sold to to couples in America. You know, mm -hmm. babies just taken off women and and sold, basically. Well, nuns were so. We didn't sell them. It was in return for a charitable contribution, mm. you know. But basically, babies were sold. You know, this kind of stuff could just go on, and and because there was this, there was a kind of collusion by a lot of people with it, you know, because yeah. because this idea that yes, we might be poor and underdeveloped, but we were we were better than everybody else because we were purer. It, it, it did sort of work for a lot of Irish people too at some sort of psychological mm -hmm. level. It meant you didn't have to be ashamed to be Irish because you could say, well, yes, you know, we, we, we may not, you know, have all the things that other people have, but but just look at us, we're a spiritual beacon to the world, you know. And, but, you know, the, one thing you really don't want to be is a spiritual beacon, you know. <laughs> it's much more fun to be um, normal, you know. Uh, and, and, but it, 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 it did sort of have this kind of very toxic sort of mm -hmm. effect. Um, Right, and, and the book traces how that changes and and d is diminished in in more recent years. What kind of beacon is Ireland now, if any, if it if it has a chance of being a beacon at all? Well, you know, some 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 remarkable things have happened. You know, so so the process that I try to describe in the book really is this I don't know modernization or whatever globalization, all of that happening painfully, in very awkward, complex ways, moving forward, moving backwards, but. You know, I, I have no nostalgia for the, the place I grew up in. You know, I, I, Ireland now is a much better place. You know, for all the huge problems with global capitalism and multinational companies and all the rest of it, you know, you know, like education. I mean, Ireland is now one of the best educated countries in the world. It was one of the worst educated countries in the developed world when I was born. Um, Ireland was the first country in the world to introduce same-sex marriage by popular vote. Right, other people had done it by courts deciding it or parliaments deciding it, but you know the actual you know the people of Ireland voted two to one. You know, um, the I, I don't mean to be complacent about this, but for an emigrant culture, like for a place that exported people so much and was so much part of the mentality to become an immigrant culture, which happened really very dramatically from the from the, particularly the late 1990s onwards. 17% of people living in Ireland now were born somewhere else, you know. And I'm not, I'm absolutely not saying there's no racism or there's no anti-immigrant mm -hmm. stuff, but Ireland doesn't have an anti-immigrant party, for example. It doesn't have a Trump, it doesn't have a Le Pen, it doesn't have a sort of Brexiteer thing or an Orban in Hungary. It doesn't really have that in any sort of big way. You go to most communities in Ireland, and actually, somehow, this historic memory, I think, is is still working. You know, where people think, yeah, that person from Nigeria or that person from the Ukraine or that person, they're like us. You know, that that particularly for people of my generation, you know, you think that that could have been me, it could have been my son, my daughter. You know, the, the, there's still very much the sense that we sort of know what it's like to be the outsider. And I'm not at all saying that there's not you know, the, the opposite going on. But actually the society has been very good at dealing with this. And if I were to be optimistic, I would say that somehow this doubleness hasn't gone away, but maybe the good side of the doubleness, which is plurality. You right. know, just accepting that actually to be Irish is is 
to be complicated, to be ambiguous, to have, you know, lots of different, you can mm -hmm. be Irish and something else. A creative ambiguity. You know, the creative ambiguity might, might be more to the fore now than the than the toxic negative side of it. It's interesting that, and you know, we'll pretty much be finishing on this because we want to open up to questions from the audience, but that that doubleness didn't give rise or hasn't so far, fingers crossed, to a culture of conspiracy theories in the way that we see in other places. You know, that kind of living the double in that doubled way and paying attention to gossip and, and, and um, double speak as much as to official spe uh, speech can, can often be very close to the kind of circumstances in which a belief in con conspiracy theories arise, arises. Um, but that hasn't, that's part of what is, what is heartening so far about Irish culture, that th th those, those theories, which we see doing so much damage in the United States and elsewhere, Absolutely. haven't, um, they're not given the same credibility. Maybe because we're so good at spotting uh, fantastical stories. Yeah, we're, we're very good at telling, good at telling them, them, so we, right? we kind of recognize yeah. them, I think. Yeah, I think, you know I think that is true. You yeah. know what a ridiculous story looks like when, you're, when you know how to yeah. tell them. And, and, and I, I think, I, you know, there, like, there's a healthy skepticism rather than a conspiracy, conspiracy theory, I think, in the culture, you know, which is people have learned not to believe a lot of what they were told. Huge disillusionment, you know, I mean, and... and can you imagine for most Irish Catholics, I mean, really deeply believing Irish Catholics, the trauma, again, of watching their church destroy itself by lying about this, all this abuse. Um, but uh, it, I think for, for a lot of people, although that's very difficult and, and very dark, it's also experienced as a kind of liberation, you know. And there's a funny thing that people sort of realize that, you know what, I'm more moral than they are. You know, I, I, I behave more morally than, than a bishop who was telling me all the things I had to do, and particularly mm -hmm. women. Like my, my mother, you know, was, was in her 80s when all this stuff was happening. She was an absolutely passionate, deeply believing Catholic, you know. And she, she just kept going to Mass every day and, and kept, you know, believing and, and, and getting great, you know, consolation and, and joy out of her religion. And just had absolute contempt for the bishops and the clerics. You know, she just said, you know, th they lied to me. They lied to me all my life. I did everything they told me to do. I had children, more children than I wanted to have. I did, you know, I did. I had never used contraceptives. They lied to me all my life. But they can't take this away from me. I'm not going. I'm not going to let them take my religion away from me. It's a funny kind of way of dealing with it, isn't it? That you know, that you you see, the the the, the bishops and that hierarchy as having been the enemy of your religion. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great healthy way of dealing with it, actually, of saying, you know, this is complex and it's ambiguous and I sort of know who, who I want to be. And it's, it's a more complex, ambiguous, open sort of mm -hmm. person than I was taught to be by people that I learned to respect and then learned to disrespect. It has a lot to do with privacy, actually. And with, you know, you, you, yeah. in, uh, you highlight the moment where uh, Brian Friel in translations came up with the, the phrase interpreting between the privacies. But I mean, for the, the, the two most recent referenda in Ireland were at, at some level about the right to privacy, you know, to, the right to, 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 to love whoever you wish uh, without having to explain yourself. Uh, the right to terminate pregnancy without having to ask permission. Yeah. Um, those sort of privacies are respected, I suppose. But that does bring us to, to the questions from the audience, which uh, the first one actually one, you know, is about um, direct provision, which we mentioned uh, in passing. But and maybe you give a little bit of context for, for what, for what <laughs> direct provision is. And this question asks whether the, the Irish government is still burying its head in terms of direct provision. Also, the housing crisis, multinational tax avoidance through Ireland and other issues. But perhaps we could focus to begin with on direct provision. And that is very much, it was on our minds before in the green room beforehand, we were talking about the very generous response um, of, of Ireland to the, the intake of uh, refugees from Ukraine. But one of the worries, of course, is that they will end up living in another version of direct provision. Uh, so I'll maybe just explain. Um, so this was... Uh, you know, as I said, Ireland had no experience of inward migration much, really, you know, on, on any large scale uh, until until the 1990s. And then, you know, Ireland started becoming an, an attractive place for people to, to want to come, particularly people who were seeking asylum. Uh, and Ireland set up a system which was called direct provision, which was it, it sort of housed people in official accommodation, gave them a tiny amount of money, and just they got their meals and they got, you know, accommodation. And in a way, this seemed kind of fine because it was all supposed to be for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months while your asylum claim was being processed. And then you could go out and 
you know, if you if your asylum was granted, you could, you know, be, become a citizen and live your life. Live your life. Uh, but sort of, just horrifically, the, the the system just got completely clogged up, and they just left people, oh, you know, year after year in this sort of temporary accommodation, and they were given, I think it was nine 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 euro a, a week, mm-hmm. you know. And they couldn't work to, you know, to, to respond seven to eight dollars. They couldn't work. They couldn't. They couldn't. You know, do anything. So uh, you know, it, it's it's the thing you always have to remember. You know that I'm writing a lot about you know what happened in the 1950s, 1960s. You know, and you really have to always ask yourself what's happening now. You know what? And remember, there were also children in in the system. So often families coming. I mean, for a child to be raised in that those sorts of circumstances is is just outrageous. You know, um, and and what happens, you see, is that. Once people can get out of an institution and into our society, most of our society is 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 terrific. Actually, you know, they say, "Oh, you know, they'll know your name and they know who you are and they know your kids and your kids will play with their kids and then mm-hmm. the kids will be playing in the local sports club and you know and then you're you're sort of your friends, you know." Mm-hmm. But but if you don't get that bit, you know, if you don't if you're cut off from all of that, you're not a person. And if you're not a person, nobody really kind of cares about you or, or, or really n- knows what's happening to you. you know. And a, a small society like Ireland, the great strength of it is that actually once people know you as a person, then actually it can be genuinely really, really lovely place to be. And a lot of people have fantastic experiences. But this, this system really was very much one that kind of kept people away. The government's now ending the system, but there's a real problem because they've there's a housing crisis and they don't have places to put people. You know, if, you, if you're out of these institutional settings, where, where are you going to go? But it finally accepted that the system was completely wrong and, and should never have been allowed to, 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 to exist. Um, uh, but I, I really hope they kind of speed up getting people out of it and, and into society. And how do you rate this, well, this, let me say this government, I mean, it may not, it will change over the, the, the near future more than likely, but how do you rate the Irish government's um, chances of uh, creating a smooth transition for that and also, I suppose, creating a context in which the incoming Ukrainian refugees can actually live their lives in Ireland rather than be institutionalized? Yeah, you know, we're, 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 we're I mean, our, Ireland never had what most Western European countries had, which has had a social democratic government at some point, you know, which actually took public provision as the center of what government should do. You know. So the health service is kind of strange and chaotic. The education system, although Ireland's become a very, very well-educated population and there's some fantastic aspects to it, is also very odd and chaotic and very sectarian. It's very difficult, you know, for someone moving back to Ireland with young children, you know, like you might be, to, you know, if you're not a Catholic, all the schools are still Catholic, mm-hmm. you know, all this kind of stuff is, is kind of strange. And housing is is sort of insane. You know, there, there's been no uh, co- coherent housing policy. So you have a rapidly rising population, which is fantastic, really wonderful to see. Uh, and, you know, makes Ireland in many ways a great place to be. It's very young, vibrant, you know, all that stuff is, is terrific. Uh, but a real problem about where people are going to live because government has never really taken responsibility for this, you know. So uh, the, the part of the bargain with Ireland was that we got modernized by bringing in particularly American capital, mm-hmm. which ha- has been in general extremely positive. I wouldn't want Pfizer or Microsoft or any of those companies to leave Ireland, you know, that <laughs> they've been really important in terms of this transformation. But there's something that happens when you outsource your development, as it were. You you kind of you bring it in rather than doing it fully organically. And it means that all these sort of institutional things just haven't been done. Like people are shocked. Well, you wouldn't be too shocked in America because a lot a lot of American infrastructure is also very bizarre. And we get a sort of American attitude to some of these things rather than a European one, you know. And so people are shocked when they come to New York and they realize the sidewalks are falling falling apart, you know, in one of the richest cities in the world or that, the, you know, the 
the, the, the train stations are awful or th things like, you know, that it doesn't make sense. You know, why, why is the public realm not valued? And Ireland got some of that, I think, by becoming Americanized rather than Europeanized. So simple thing, if, if, I, if, you, if you fly into Dublin Airport, for example, you can't get a train into the city center. You just can't get one. There isn't one. There's no train station. You know, and it, it, it's that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So like something like Ireland's now saying it's going to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees, which is wonderful. You know, proportionally way more than you know than Britain or other countries, and you think, well, this is a wonderful gesture, but like, where are people going to live? And you know, how are the kids who might be traumatized going to get access to healthcare? And you know, we're just not good at that mm -hmm. infrastructural stuff. Um, I think we will get good at it because it just it just has to. You know, there's a huge pressure from from younger people. I think for for all of this stuff to change, but there's a real lag between the sophistication and development of the society on the one hand and the infrastructure and the way government works on the other hand. I mean, that grassroots response has been so important in recent years and in, in, in terms of the referenda, for example. So yeah. this is partly a grassroots response that we're seeing to some extent yeah. as well. There's some really great questions here. We won't get to all of them, unfortunately, but one um, audience member asks if you can comment on how you see the doubleness of what must be silenced or hidden in Irish American culture. If you do see that, and yeah, well, it's it's a it's a fantastic question, isn't it? You know, um, I mean, I, I have huge admiration for for Irish American culture in, in general. You know, um, but there is this sort of well, traditionally for a long time, there's been this sort of very oddly collusive relationship between Ireland and Irish America. You know, where the Irish tell Irish Americans what they think they want to hear, and Irish Americans believe what they would like to believe about Ireland, you know, and of course some of this has been dramatized, right, in New York, if you think about the, the I don't know if people know about the controversies, for example, around the St. Patrick's Day Parade mm -hmm. with, you know, the LGBTQ community not being allowed to march, whereas in Dublin, you know, you would have had like, you know, LGBTQ people leading the parade, you know, this sort of <laughs> disjunction between a very conservative idea of what Ireland's supposed to be like and what it's actually like. And for a long time, this was very, very collusive. I mean, you know, that, that, that sort of, uh, sort of patronizing attitude of the Irish to the Irish Americans, mm -hmm. you know, well, you don't really understand, so we'll just, we'll just feed you nonsense, you know, <laughs> and take your money, take your money, of course, <laughs> if you, you know, if you want to pay for the nonsense, we'll, we'll supply that. Um, uh, uh, the silences in Irish America, of course, a lot of it's about race, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like the silences about everything in America. I mean... We know that vast numbers of, well, there's a lot of Muhammad Ali's, right? So there's, there's a very large number of, of Irish Americans of color, right? Just, just, you know, in this city, if you, if you go back and you read Charles Dickens coming to New York in the 1840s, you know, what's he shocked by? The thing that really shocks him when he's taken down to the five points is, is the Irish and the African Americans commingling in these dives and dancing together. And, you know, there was a very large number of, of you know, a lot of intermarriage. There's, there's, a, there's a, you know, there's a lot of descendants of, you know, there's a lot of people whose, whose biological relationship to Ireland is the same as people who call themselves Irish American. But there's this notion that to be Irish American is to be white, which is, which is deeply problematic. In the 1880s, one third of all Chinese men in New York were married to Irish women. Not the same Irish woman, but 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 you know, um, you know, like there, there's so the, the whole whole the whole idea of what Irish America is, mm. is is you know how it's defined, is is very very problematic still. I think. I mean, Ella Fitzgerald, for example, you know, what, what, is she the same as John Fitzgerald Kennedy? You know, are they are, is that Fitzgerald the same Fitzgerald? You know, you just start thinking about African American people with Irish names. You know, what what, what how, how does all that work? Um, the Ali thing was fascinating, for example, because so Ali was really angry when people started saying, but you're an O'Grady from County Clare, because he said, that's slavery. That's a slave mm -hmm. name. I don't want a slave name. And actually, then when people researched it, discovered that, that actually, no, it wasn't slavery. That it was, you know, it was a free black woman who was married to a free Irish man, you know, of which there were an awful lot. But that whole history is just kind of buried and, 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 and not there. And, uh, uh, you know, not to be too controversial, which wouldn't be like me, but I mean, I, I found absolutely revolting some of the Trump stuff around immigration. You know, that, that the good immigrants now were the, were the Irish, you know. You look at, you know, 
Mick Mulvaney and so many of these people around Trump, the Flynn's, the you know all those know. Irish names, yeah, all those Irish names. And you know Trump, the first year in office, right? While he was doing, we're going to build a wall, we're going to keep the rapists out. All you know, he declared March uh, to be Irish American Heritage Month. You know, and they issued a big thing about the, you know, the heroism of migrants, these people who had nothing, who came in, and look at what they've contributed to American society. You know, while you know, promulgating the most appalling stereotypes about about migrants. You know, and 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 the thing that Irish migration, you know, brings back to you is these. If you go back to the nine, the eighteen forties, eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, you know, the 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 worst, most most impoverished, you know, completely, I mean, disease-ridden. I mean, there was a, there was a shanty town in Central Park, you know, of tents of Irish people living in them, you know. I mean, if you want bad migrants, you know, people who you say, oh, we don't want those people, you know, well, the Irish are pretty good candidates for it, you know. And because they were able to get a chance somehow, you know, they got a foothold in society, you know. Yes, they did make an extraordinary, and continue to make, Fantastic contributions to, to 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 American society, just as Jewish Americans have, just as you know Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, you know, go on and on and on. You know, every immigrant group has done this, but it, it, there's something really deeply, deeply wrong, I think, in the way that the Irish are almost kind of the the message is, well, we climbed up the ladder, so why can't you? Well, mm -hmm. maybe the fact that we were white might have something to do with it. You know, mm -hmm. chances come to. Chances come to chancers, right? <laughs> Fintan O'Toole, thank you so much for talking to us about your wonderful book. Um, I can't recommend this book highly enough. It's superb. Uh, so do get your copy and have Fintan sign it for you. Thanks again to everyone here at the library, to you for coming. Um, happy March. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks, Fintan. Thank you.